Uh, I'm going to invite him to stage, but first I want to pray for him, and then I'm going to pass it off to him as we begin this series tonight. But one thing I did want to say is at the end, we will have about 15 to 20 minutes of questions. And so uh, on the screen behind me, uh, there should be a uh, text, uh, sorry, a phone number that you can text your questions anonymously. And so I have a nice computer up here that uh, I will be receiving those questions, and at the end, I will be asking those on behalf of you. So if you have a question, it's our number is 234-236-7800. We will put that up a couple more times in our workshop this evening. But again, thank you for coming. Let me pray, and then I will pass it off uh, to Jonathan. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to be here tonight, Lord, to spend some time uh, discussing these uh, topics, Lord, that are so prevalent right now in our society, Lord. I pray for those that are walking through um, these things, Lord, that you would give them some freedom tonight, Lord, that you would minister to them in a, such a special way as Jonathan speaks, Lord, and uh, we as a church family can come beside them and minister, Lord. Help us, for those of us who know someone who's walking through these things, Lord, that you better equip us, Lord, to love uh, and to walk through and journey with these people, Lord, that are dealing with such hard things. Lord, thank you again for your word and how you direct us through uh, truth and love. And Lord, ultimately, we know that we have a Savior, Lord, that uh, begs us to come uh, to him and labor, take our labor to him, Lord, that we might find rest. And so I pray that we might find that this evening and pray into Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you welcome Jonathan to the stage? Well, thanks so much, Dan, and, and to Todd and the rest of the team here at Silver Creek. It really is uh, such a pleasure. I've never been here before uh, in your facility and in your church, and uh, I'm just so thrilled. We think of you often uh, in terms of just gospel preaching, gospel-centered churches in our area, and we think and pray for you, and uh, just are so thankful to have partners in ministry uh, like you uh, here at Silver Creek. Uh, hopefully all of you guys got the handout when you came in, just to give you a little bit of a breakdown of uh, what our aims uh, hopefully will be. Uh, at the first part, uh, we want to spend a little bit of time really trying to get a handle on understanding anxiety and depression, understanding what it looks like, how it affects and how it impacts us. And that'll kind of be the first part of our talk. We'll take a brief break uh, and then we'll come back and in the second half of our talk, we want to move forward in terms of what does it look like to help those uh, with anxiety and depression. If we just maybe even took a show of hands, like how many of you know someone who in your life, neighbor, family, friends, has struggled with or is struggling with anxiety or depression? Just slip your hand up, right? Look, I mean, look around. Uh, you're not alone, right? We are not alone in this together. And so I am so humble and so thankful to be able to think out loud with you about this topic uh, from a biblical perspective. As we kind of begin to move through and hopefully past uh, the most severe of the COVID pandemic and uh, the, the physical impact of it, I think what many of us realize on the other side of this is what has remained for us are the mental health effects of COVID. And those are being discussed now with increased frequency and I would say also alarm and concern. Uh, one well-known hotline called the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, they kind of monitor phone calls coming in for different hotlines, different people uh, seeking mental health help. And they said that in the past two years, calls into these various hotlines have increased 891%. 800, like not just 89.1% or, you know, 189, 891% increase in, in calls of people just seeking help uh, for anxiety, depression, suicide, and a whole host of other mental health issues. Some of the stats on anxiety, which uh, won't uh, surprise very many of you, but anxiety is an issue that affects and afflicts many of us. It's the number one mental health issue uh, that we face in America today, even outpacing depression. Uh, reports tell us that nearly one in five Americans struggle with anxiety issues. That's roughly 65 million people. And even just by our, our very unscientific show of hands a few moments ago, right, this is something that impacts all of you in a very personal way. 62% of Americans were recently polled and they said that they felt more anxious today than they did two years ago, which again, uh, won't be a surprise for any of us. Uh, the depression stats are very similar to anxiety. An estimated 17 million 
million adults in the U.S. have had at least one major depressive episode. That represents nearly uh, 8% of all U.S. adults. Uh, the prevalence uh, for depression is highest among women, uh, far outpacing men. And the prevalence of adults in terms of an age group or a category is highest among individuals ages 18 through 25. So if you are a female, you are at a much significant risk, higher risk uh, for depression than your male counterparts. And if you are a woman age 18 to 25, you are at an even significantly greater risk to be suffering from depression. Approximately 35% of adults with uh, some type of depression or anxiety uh, will never seek treatment for that, meaning they'll never get on a medication, they'll never seek counseling. Uh, Dr. Catherine Butler explains a little bit why. Why is that number so high in terms of people experiencing such strong symptoms and, and, and effects of anxiety and depression? Why aren't they getting help? She says in a survey of 5.4 million adults in the U.S. reporting an unmet need for mental health services, here's the various breakdown. Eight percent did not seek mental health treatment because they did not want others to find out. Nine percent because it might cause neighbors and community to have a negative opinion. And 9.6 percent due to concerns about confidentiality. Some 28 percent believe that they could handle the problem without treatment. And 22% roughly did not know where to go to receive treatment. Such statistics, if you add all of those up, nearly 78% of the, of the 5.4 million adults who don't receive treatment reveals that that road to seeking treatment and the road to healing slouches uphill and many people tread it alone, she writes, right? When we think about anxiety and depression, the, the roadblocks and the obstacles to getting treatment, to talking to someone uh, are quite significant for many people. When we think about access and shame and stigma that is associated with these topics, and that's why, uh, personally, I'm so thankful that you guys are taking time to think through these topics because oftentimes, especially in the church, for a variety of reasons, uh, we don't talk about anxiety and depression because there is such a stigma and such a shame surrounding both of these two mental health issues. Well, while those stats are certainly enlightening and although not surprising, right, we, we actually wanna get a little bit deeper and we want to get more personal, right? What, is, what does anxiety actually look like and how does it impact us? It won't surprise any of us that anxiety is a complex issue that uh, just is not gonna be uh, answered or figured out with a few simplistic or biblistic answers. And so what I wanna do tonight is to talk about three different ways that anxiety and depression impact all of us. And so the first category and the first way that it impacts us is this, is that anxiety affects us physically. It affects our body, right? When we think about anxiety, a lot of times we, we are asking ourselves, what, what's the difference between anxiety or fear, or worries, or, or stresses? And uh, one of the things that we talk about in counseling at Fieldstone is just kind of this simple cycle where we say worried thoughts produce anxious feelings which then produce stressed bodies, right? When you're kind of thinking about that cycle of anxiety, worried thoughts producing anxious feelings, which then produce stressed bodies. So uh, maybe some type of worried thought comes into your mind. Maybe you know it's uh, about, you know, you're about to go to bed uh, before church one night and you're thinking to yourself about, you know, whether or not your child's gonna be able to go into nursery without crying and screaming, whether or not you're gonna get called out into service, right? And you're able to go to sleep but the next morning, right? Those worried thoughts are turning into anxious feelings and you come into church, right? and you drop Bobby off at the nursery and you, you think everything's gonna be okay and then you come into service and you just notice you're, you're quite elevated because you can't stop thinking about whether or not you're gonna get called out in the middle of the service to, to go back and get Bobby because he's not gonna be able to make it at nursery, right? That's, that's very similar to the cycle that, that many of us experience with anxiety. What starts off as a worried thought then turns into an anxious feeling which then over time, right, produces this feeling of stress in our body. One woman describes her personal experience, and I wonder how many of you here might identify or also resonate with her story. Uh, Rachel Miller writes this. She says, concerns that any ordinary person would have about normal things, things like children or finances or career or relationships or health, they, they skyrocket. She says, your mind immediately imagines the worst possible outcomes of reasonable concerns, a loop of anxiety that begins with the initial surge of panic, and it ends in a replay of catastrophic outcomes uh, that run in your mind. She says, this cycle is repeated dozens of times in a given day, and you can't make it stop. 
As much as you try, you're unable to let go of things, quote, like normal people do. Once your mind locks onto something, it's nearly impossible to get it loose. Someone captured this sensation of acute anxiety as a relentless embracing of dread. It comes complete with physiological effects, shortness of breath, increased heart rate, disorientation, and exhaustion. Right, like the writer above, we know that anxiety impacts our bodies, right? In Proverbs 12, 25, the author tells us that anxiety in our heart, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, right? That there's a physical impact that that anxiety has on us as embodied beings, right? All of us could list certain classic symptoms then that we experience in our bodies physically uh, when anxiety and panic strike. Some of those classic symptoms uh, look something like this, uh, having shortness of breath, having racing heartbeat, uh, rising blood pressure, uh, a lot of times feeling that hotness in the ears, right? You just can't even help it, but suddenly you can just feel the blood rush into your ears and just feel this hotness in your body. Uh, sweaty palms, dizziness, feeling faint, short of breath, foggy thinking or memory, somebody asking you, hey, what are you doing? And just not being able immediately to be able to provide an answer because you're not able to connect your thoughts together in a cohesive way. Uh, just overall and general fatigue, right? Those are all just classic physical symptoms that we oftentimes associate with anxiety. And while initially we might think of those symptoms as negatives, there's also, and I would want to encourage all of us in this way, that also there is a positive, there's a silver lining to many of those things. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times what those symptoms are telling us is that in many ways it's telling us our body is not able to handle what we're currently going through. Our, our body's not in a good spot when we begin to experience some of those things physically. When you experience anxiety, which leads to that stress, that stressed body, your body's actually physically doing something in that moment. It's releasing what we call stress hormones, things like cortisol and adrenaline. And in the good side of your body, those stress hormones normally help you do good things, right? They, they help you either flee or fight. So uh, you're about to take a step into a crosswalk and you see a car uh, that's going at a high pace, right? And you immediately back up and you pull your kid back, right? That's, that's that adrenaline running through your body, and that's a, that's a good thing, right? It's a, it's a God-given mechanism to help our bodies respond and react to a perceived threat. Unfortunately, what anxiety and what stress does to us is it keeps us at that elevated state for prolonged periods of time that we weren't meant to live in. And what many mental health practitioners are recognizing and realizing is that for many of us collectively, we've been living in that heightened state for probably at least two and a half years since COVID started, right? So for many of us, that normal state might last a few seconds or maybe a few moments, maybe, maybe at best an hour or so. We might have that racing heartbeat, that sense of, oh, something dangerous is about to happen. But collectively and globally, right, for the past two and a half years, all of us have been in that heightened state for a significantly prolonged period of time. And researchers tell us that prolonged stress, and when we live at that elevated level, uh, it exacerbates a lot of other health conditions, right? Things like cardiovascular disease and respiratory issues. Uh, one mental health practitioner writes this. She says, maintaining this level of hyperarousal or of being at that high state of anxiety just isn't sustainable. It ultimately just wears you down. And so oftentimes when people are thinking about that connection from anxiety to depression, one of the connection points is this, is that after living with this heightened state for a long period of time, people get worn down. People just frankly give up. They, they realize that they just can't adjust to this new normal, and it leads to significant states of either depression or paralysis or just overall fatigue. Why? Because your body, right, is not used to living in this kind of state, in this state of arousal for this period of time. Your body's just not meant to do that, and so you begin to shut down. You begin to uh, withdraw and isolate from others around you, right? That's, that's just one way, right, when we're think about how anxiety and then depression impact us, right? That's just one category, how it impacts us physically. 
Uh, secondly, anxiety is also impacting us emotionally, right? Not only is it impacting us physically, but it's also affecting and impacting us emotionally. I don't know about you, but when uh, I think about emotions, right, and as you guys think about emotions over the past few weeks, right, uh, a friend of mine compared emotions to those lights on our dashboard. Uh, I don't, I, I'll have to confess my ignorance. Is Aurora in Jaga County or is it in Summit County? Oh, you're in Port. Okay, see, I don't even know my counties. Well, I don't know about Portage County, but I live in Summit County. And in Summit County, you cannot get your uh, license or your tags renewed until what? Until you get e-checked. Is that the same for you guys in Portage County? Right. So every year, I have a borderline panic attack as soon as I see one of those lights on my dashboard pop up. Because it always seems to happen right around the exact same time I have got to get my vehicle cleared for e-check. Right. I, have, I drive a 2012 Nissan Altima, and inevitably, right, one of those lights is going to pop up, that check engine light. Right. And all of us do different things, right, when we see those lights on the dashboard. Right. Uh, if you're like me, you hyper-focus on it. Right. And you you want to get it fixed immediately because you're nervous that something's wrong, right? You might be like uh, my wife, who she just ignores the light, right? She just says, hey, it's not a big deal. We're still driving. There's still four wheels on this van. We're just going to kind of keep plowing through, right? Right? All of us have different relationships with how we deal with those lights on the dashboard of our life, as it were, right? Some of us, uh, if those lights represent emotions, right? Some of us, we, uh, we view emotions as everything. We stare at the light. We can't, we can't let our gaze move past them, and oftentimes they can kind of paralyze us. Uh, other times, we view those lights uh, or we view those emotions as nothing. We kind of ignore them or we kind of uh, suppress them, right? I uh, asked a guy earlier this week just a few questions about emotions. I just said, hey, what are you, what are you feeling right now? If you could just identify it. And he said, I don't know. I, I really don't know how to describe what I'm feeling. And for many of you, that might be where you're at. Uh, those, I would say those extremes of either uh, emotions are everything, and so you stare at the light and you hyper-focus on the light, uh, and then the other extreme of, hey, emotions are nothing, and I just ignore them or suppress them, right? Neither of those are, are good options for us when we think about our emotional well-being, and especially when we think about anxiety and depression. And so this via media that I think is helpful for us is that we realize that those emotions or those lights on the dashboard of our life are actually opportunities to say, hey, what's going on below the surface, right? Just like a check engine light that pops up on our dashboard is meant to tell us, hey, pull up your hood, right? Something, something is amiss underneath the hood. Why don't you check it out? Tim St. John writes this. He says, when you engage what you are feeling, when you engage these emotions, you start to understand what it is that your heart treasures. He says, our emotions reveal our hearts and they help us see what we worship. Rather than minimizing emotions, it's good to find as many as we can and listen to what they are saying. Understanding our emotions allows us to better understand our hearts. Understanding and engaging what we feel is the beginning of how we turn to God and rightly respond to our situation. And one of the premier places, right, where we see this play out in action is the Psalms, right? The Psalms are this wonderful book that we have in Scripture where God essentially is saying, listen, here is an invitation for you to pray back and sing back and talk to me about what's going on below. What is it that you're feeling? How do you feel in these various situations, whether you feel endangered or scared or forsaken or left alone, right? Scripture, more than any other place, is actually inviting us to be honest about these things. When we are honest about the role that emotions play in our life and when we speak about those things with honesty and vulnerability, they actually become powerful tools for connection. Uh, one of the things when we think about anxiety and depression, one of the very simple things that people will tell you is that just simply naming some of those emotions, simply talking about them in and of itself, that can have a very helpful effect in just alleviating the anxiety and the depression. It's a dynamic that we call effect labeling, where we just simply name, hey, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now, or I'm feeling really stressed out, or I'm just, I'm feeling really disconnected or I'm feeling embarrassed, right? Just simply voicing those things in and of itself, that simple act of just sharing that and being vulnerable, not only can it be a powerful tool for connection, but it can actually be a way that we relieve some of those symptoms. 
So anxiety is impacting us physically, it's impacting us emotionally, and here's the third category that we wanna talk about. Anxiety is impacting us spiritually. It's impacting us spiritually, right? The, the first two, we might say that just from a general, uh, just a general secular gaze, as it were, that, that the world might say, yeah, we, we understand anxiety and depression and how it's impacting us in those two particular ways, but our Christian gaze draws us a little bit deeper and we realize that anxiety and depression also impact us spiritually, right? We are physically embodied souls, right? We have souls, we have hearts that are actively worshiping before God. Ed Welch writes this about anxiety and how it impacts us. He says, our worries, and you can sub in our fears, our worries, our anxieties, they, they tend to imagine a future without God in it, right? Our worries and our anxieties and our fears, they tend to imagine a future without God in it, and they tend to imagine a future without God in it, and then we catastrophize, right, or we globalize that future without God in it. Anxiety impacts our faith in our spiritual life, and what I've at least found personally, what I'm sure you've also found, is that anxiety, especially over the past two and a half years, it's, it's no respecter of persons, right? Meaning that anxiety and depression aren't just problems that weak Christians face, or just that spiritually immature Christians face. Right? I think it's very easy for us to believe the lie that, that only people who don't have strong faith or who aren't trusting in the Lord, those are really the people who struggle with anxiety and depression. If you just really trust God or have enough faith or keep your eyes on him, that those issues of anxiety and depression really won't impact you. But we know that that's not the case, right? We know that anxiety and depression affects people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, and from all various uh, levels of spiritual maturity. Let me just throw out one person to you. I think about the Apostle Paul, right? When we think about Paul, right, we might think about this uh, phenomenal itinerant preacher who wrote a huge part of the New Testament, and it's just this, this wonderful contender for the faith. But what we probably don't think about the Apostle Paul is his own struggles with mental health. Right? We probably don't think about some of the acute struggles of anxiety that he talked about and that he was honest about. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. Paul says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. That, that second phrase there that Paul mentions where he says that we are perplexed but not driven to despair. If you do a little bit of uh, kind of Greek word search, what you'll understand about that word perplexed, it's getting at just this idea of anxiety, of getting stuck and, and getting very paralyzed in one's mind, right? Paul's saying, listen, we have, we've been to that spot where, where I've been so anxious but not driven to despair, right? That, that loop or that progression of going from anxiety to depression. Listen to what he says later on in the book. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. Paul says, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my, what? Of my anxiety for all the churches, right? What Paul is just alluding to there and being very honest about, right, is he's planted, you know, tons of churches all across Asia Minor. He says, I have a daily anxiety about them, right? I'm thinking to myself, what's going on in Thessalonica? What's going on in Berea? What's going on in the church at Philippi, right? I, I am dealing with a daily pressure or anxiety every single day, right? There's just this fundamental and profound honesty, right? No sense of stigma, no sense of shame if people are gonna now make fun of me, just an openness and an honesty of this is how I feel, this is the way I experience what's going on. He says this later in Philippians 2.28. He says, I am the more eager to send him, talking about Epaphroditus to Philippi, he says, I'm the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be what? I may be less anxious, right? There was a lot of anxiety about what was going on with Paul and what was going on at the church at Philippi, and so Paul was eager to send Epaphroditus to see what was going on, right? And Paul's just very honest, right? There's probably a lot of things that he wants to have happen with that visit, but one of them is, listen, I, I don't want to be so anxious. And so when Epaphroditus goes and brings me back a report, that's going to help bring this level of anxiety down, right? And I say all that simply to say this, right? If the apostle Paul right, struggles with anxiety, and I think we would all agree that he loved the Lord and treasured Christ, right, that in many ways, I think that puts us all in a good camp too, right? For those of us uh, that know someone who struggles with anxiety and depression, maybe uh, you're parenting someone who struggles with anxiety or depression, maybe you're married to someone who has anxiety and depression, 
right? What we immediately begin to realize then in terms of how anxiety uh, impacts us spiritually is this isn't something that is just for a certain subset of weak, immature Christians, but this is something that affects and impacts all of us, right? So when we think about, and we might summarize uh, some of what we talked about like this with some of these thoughts about anxiety and depression, the first of which is this, and this is really just summarizing what we just said. You can be a Christian. I would want everyone to, to really take this to heart. You can be a Christian and still struggle with depression and anxiety, right? We need to be able to say that, to be able to believe that, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to be honest about the struggles that we're facing so that we can allow not only God's word and God's people to be able to speak into those realities. I listen to Susanna Wesley talking about her husband, Charles Wesley, who notoriously struggled with depression. She says, my beloved's anguish was so deep and was so violent, that's probably just a fancy way of talking about his depression or his despair, she says, my beloved's anguish was so deep and so violent that reason seemed to totter in her throne, and we sometimes feared that Charles would never be able to preach again. Right? Again, Charles Wesley, this great uh, figure of the faith, as it were. Again, we know him for a lot of different things, but right, just the simple acknowledgement of even someone like him struggled with anxiety and depression. Uh, number two, and there's another way that we might summarize where we have come from is this. Depression and anxiety simply reveal that our bodies are yearning for redemption. Depression and anxiety reveal that our bodies are yearning for redemption. We know from Romans 8 and from 2 Corinthians 4 that as physically embodied beings, right, that because of the impact of the fall, our bodies are not always going to operate as they should. Right? One of the ways then that that fallenness and that brokenness impacts our bodies is that we're going to probably experience many of the different symptoms that, that we might describe now as anxiety and depression. Two individuals uh, historically in church history who famously struggled with depression in particular, one was Martin Luther and the second was Spurgeon. Listen to what uh, Martin Luther said. Martin Luther uh, famously struggled with excruciating kidney stones, uh, constant headaches, buzzing in his ears, ear infections. Uh, and listen to what he writes. He says, I nearly gave up the ghost and now bathed in blood, I can find no peace. What took four days, he was talking about some type of like, uh, some type of surgery that he had had. He said, what took four days to heal immediately tears open again. Just talking about this immense pain Later on, he'll write in a letter to his friend Melanchthon. He says, for more than a week, I have been thrown back and forth in death and in hell. He says, my whole body feels beaten. My limbs are still trembling. He says, I almost lost Christ completely, driven about on the waves and storms of despair and blasphemy against God. But because of the intercession of the faithful, God began to take mercy on me and tore my soul from the depths of hell. And again, just a very honest insight into what we would say are just these everyday struggles that we experience being embodied souls. Spurgeon is another individual who famously struggled with depression in particular. Listen to what he says. He says, from the age of 33, physical pain became a large and constant feature of life for him. He suffered from a burning kidney inflammation called Bright's disease, as well as gout, rheumatism, neuritis. The pain was such that it soon kept him from preaching nearly a third of the time. Added to that, overwork, stress, guilt about stress began to take their toll. And all this was in the public eye and was jumped on by his many critics, not making it easier to bear. The suffering they had argued about Spurgeon rather predictably was a judgment from God. And Spurgeon later described what he went through, saying, the flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more, but the soul it can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour, right? This immense physical pain then that impacts them spiritually, right, is again something that that we realize biblically as we understand the, the nature of what it means to be an embodied being, that our bodies are not how they should be, that they are crying out for redemption. Number three, another summary principle we might say is this, is that God sees and he hears, and we also, we also say he invites our cries of anguish and our need for help. Right? One of the things that we know about anxiety and depression is that it actually puts us into a spot 
that Jesus himself might say, this is actually the prime spot for you to receive blessing and to receive help. Right? Think about what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, blessed are the what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn, right? He doesn't say, hey, blessed are the strong. Blessed are those who never need help. Blessed are those who really have it together. Blessed are those who are able to just kind of pull themselves up by their bootstraps, right? That's, that's really what Christ is after, right? No, that's, that's not what the Beatitudes seem to be communicating, right? The Beatitudes seem to be communicating this is the path of blessing. It is acknowledging essential human need, right? That you are a needy human being, right? And anxiety and depression in very real ways forces those realities on us that uh, regardless of wherever you might find yourself at, socially, economically, relationally, at the very core, you are a needy, dependent human being. And that that need and that dependence is not a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. That scripture actually invites us to cry out and to speak these things to the Lord. Number four, Uh, Scripture offers us a compelling look at our future, though, too, with no depression and with no anxiety, right? Uh, In terms of what we think about from a post-Christian culture, right, there's, I would say, not a lot of hope as it relates to depression or anxiety, right? As you look ahead, right, uh, most Americans, if they were polled today, at least from what I've recently seen, uh, they don't have a lot of hope about what the future looks like, from rising inflation costs to the effects of COVID to uh, political controversies, right? Most Americans are not looking optimistically about the future. All of the things that were promised to us in the early 90s about medication and medication's ability to eradicate depression and anxiety, uh, 30 to 40 years later seems quite hollow. So what's the unique aspect, what's the unique benefit then of what it means to be a believer in a post-Christian culture is this, it is our hope in a future, right? It is a hope in a future where, where, where Christ says that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes, where the former things, right, in Isaiah 65, 17, he says, the former things will no longer be remembered. You will be a new creation, right? Now, that future reality does nothing per se to mitigate your present suffering, but it does change how you begin to view and how you begin to engage in these present struggles. Number five, a fifth thing that we can learn is this, is that God can be up to good amidst our depression and our anxiety, even when we don't feel it, right? God can be up to good amidst our depression and anxiety, even when we don't feel it. And again, sometimes that is something that is difficult, because when we don't feel it, we oftentimes say we don't believe it, right? So if I don't feel like God is at work, when I feel like God is absent, we then believe that that is the reality. But we realize sometimes that our emotions, right, aren't always the most reliable indicator of what's true. What is the most reliable indicator about what is true is ultimately what we know from God's word. And what we know from scripture is that even in the midst of our pain and suffering, God is up to something. He's up to something good in our lives. Martin Luther says this, he says, trials teach you not only to know and understand, but also to experience how right and how true, how sweet and how lovely, how mighty and how comforting God's word is. It is wisdom supreme. Right, when I think about uh, someone like Job, right? Job is someone who in many ways probably was struggling, maybe not so much from anxiety, but definitely from depression. Job was uh, feeling close to death. He had enormous, not only situational suffering, but a lot of physical suffering, right? Throughout the book of Job, he asked God a lot of different questions about what he's, uh, why he's struggling. And guess what? Job never gets a question, never gets an answer to those questions, right? Even at the very end of the book, right? God comes to him and ask him questions rather than answer any of them. And so when we think about depression and anxiety, right, even when we don't get answers to our questions about the whys, right, what we do know is the who, right? We do know that God is up to good. One of my favorite stories, uh, or at least from uh, a commentary that I read and studied in preparation to teach uh, through the book of John, R. Kent Hughes wrote a commentary on it, uh, on the book of John, and in the parable of the vine and the vine dresser, R. Kent Hughes talks about the, the pruning hand of the father. 
And he says, oftentimes in life, right, when we think about the pruning, which oftentimes feels painful to us, we can oftentimes feel that it's in those periods that God is most distant and most far away from us. But he says, that's actually not the case. Right, the, 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 the father's hand as the careful vine dresser, as he's pruning away different parts of us, his hand's actually never closer to us than that, right? right? All of you who are gardeners realize you don't, you don't prune with these huge, massive shears far, far away, right? You're gonna do a lot of damage, right? A gardener is going to come in with his pruning shears and very carefully and very selectively and very wisely trim away the different parts that are keeping that vine from properly growing. And so oftentimes during these seasons of pruning, right, during these seasons of anxiety and depression where we feel the Lord might be most distant from us, uh, oftentimes I think many of us who have been on the other side of it realize, no, it might actually be that during those times the Lord was closest to us and was actually up to good in our life. So what we're gonna do there is just take a brief pause We'll take a 15 minute break. We'll come back at around 7.15. And what we wanna do when we come back from the break is we wanna kinda of take some of those things that we have learned and we wanna to try to put them together and say, okay, what does it look like for us to actually help those who struggle with anxiety and depression? And we'll kind of even split that up into talking about some different things that we can uh, do as a helper. And then in the latter half of that talk, we'll actually talk about if you're actually a struggler tonight, if you're a struggler tonight, what are some practical things that you can do? So take a five minute break. We'll come back at 7.15 and resume uh, the second part of our talk. Thanks.
All right, we're going to come back together. Hopefully you guys got some uh, got some snacks and refueled. We're going to come back here in this second talk and talk about helping those uh, with anxiety and depression. And uh, again, even, you know, when I do these uh, talks on anxiety and depression, these, uh, I never know really what quite, what quite to call them. They're not steps like, oh, if I just do this and then do this, then I won't have anxiety or depression. So if they're anything, they're, they're tools. That's essentially what I'm wanting to do is to try to give you tools and resources conversationally and relationally to help you, uh, first and foremost as a helper, but then also uh, for many of you in here uh, who I would venture to say also might be strugglers as well. So here's the first thing for the helper, and we'll kind of cover a few things for the helper first and then kind of transition to the struggler. Uh, For the helper, number one, uh, just understand that there are not easy answers or fixes. There are not easy answers or fixes. Uh, When we think about anxiety and depression, they're complex issues, and simple answers to complex problems I've found uh, rarely satisfy. If anything, uh, simple answers to complex problems can oftentimes harm, uh, they can oftentimes hurt, Uh, And they can oftentimes just not, frankly, even be biblical, right? We can say things that might seem well-meaning, which we'll say a few of them in a moment, like, you know, if you just trust the Lord, or, you know, if you just do this, right? Essentially, uh, kind of like the counsel that Job's friends gave to him, right? Which was very simplistic, which was, hey, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, some bad things have happened to you, so you're a bad person, so start being a good person, right? That's, a, you know, if we could kind of condense 42 chapters of conversation dialogue, that's kind of the Jonathan Holmes paraphrase for you, right? And what, what we realize is those types of simple answers to complex problems rarely satisfy, right? We realize that we're physically embodied beings, right? We just talked about all of the different physical things that happen in our bodies due to anxiety and depression, Uh, We're also socially embedded beings, right? We all come from different backgrounds, different social economic structures, different families of origin, right? We know to some degree that there are certain aspects of depression that have certain hereditary traits, right? So oftentimes in families that have uh, acute mental health issues, right, you'll, you'll hear about a father or a grandfather or a mom or an aunt or an uncle who also similarly has struggled with depression, Uh, We also know that uh, depression and anxiety are spiritual issues, right? We talked about that, right? That that oftentimes there are spiritual dynamics and factors going on. All that to say, when we think about depression and anxiety, right, what we're not looking for are simple answers to complex problems. If anything, what we are looking for uh, as a helper is maybe we're asking these two questions. We're saying, how does it feel? Is it this or is it that, right? How does it feel? Is it this or is it that? And, and if you were to take those questions and kind of put them in your arsenal, in many ways you could begin to see how many of the different psalms have been written, right? The psalms essentially are God asking those sorts of questions to everyday people like us. Hey, what's going on in your life? How do you feel right now? Describe and tell me. Use, use the most descriptive metaphors you can find and tell me, does, does it feel like this? Does it look like this? Let, let me just give you a quick example. Turn over to Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a, a wonderful example of someone who, again, we know Psalm 22, as we read our scripture backward to forward, is, is essentially the psalm of Christ, right? Christ himself is, is saying these things, but if we pull it back to a very personal level, right, what we see is a person who is really struggling with what we might say is depression or anxiety. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? He says, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Now turn over to, to verse 14, or even pick it up in verse 12. Again, thinking about these questions of how does it feel? What does it feel like? Is, is it this or is it that, right? Are, are we getting closer to capturing your experience? David says, many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. 
He says, I'm poured out like water and all my bones, right, are out of joint, right? He's just being honest about a a physical dynamic that's present in his suffering. He says, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. And God says, well, could you be even more descriptive? What does it feel like, (laughs) right? He says in verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, right? The dynamic is he's so malnourished and emaciated, he's literally counting his ribs. He says, I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me, right? This this hyper-awareness of people stare at me. Right? There's something wrong with me. I, I stick out like a sword. I, I, I come through the doors on a Sunday morning and I feel like all eyes are on me. Right? There's something that resonates with that experience of anxiety. Right? And David's saying, they stare, they gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Right? Again, Psalm 22 is a simple example, right? but it's an example then that, that you and I as helpers can follow. Right? And the model that we follow is simply, how does it feel? Is it this or is it that? That's number one. Number two, learn what not to say, right? If if you learn anything about what to say, maybe what I'd say is, uh, you might not be able to master all of those things or ask some of those questions, but maybe at least I can equip you with this. Uh, Learn what not to say to those struggling with anxiety or depression. Uh, The the first of which is this, is uh, ask good questions, but remember that you're not an interrogator. You're not a private investigator. Sometimes I find that with anxiety or depression, we immediately, right, we we, we move into this private investigator mode, right? What's going on? Or tell me about this or how long? And we quickly can do what? We can overwhelm the person just with the sheer amount and scope and intensity of our questions, right? Now, you're not gonna you're not gonna ever hear me say don't ask questions, because I think it's a good thing to ask questions, but but know when to ask questions and know what kinds of questions to ask. Now, secondly, in learning what not to say, don't, don't assume that, that it's a sin issue. Don't assume that their suffering with anxiety or depression is ultimately rooted in sin. Uh, The famous example in John 9 where the disciples kind of make this uh, transmission error. They say, uh, John records, he says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, talking to Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Is sin a factor with anxiety and depression? We might say, maybe. Maybe. But is that always the root issue? Is that always the cause? Well, no, that's not always the case. And so when we immediately go there like a knee-jerk reaction, I think that we oftentimes do great harm. Zach Eswine writes this, and and Zach Eswine's written a really helpful book that I included in your resource uh, manual called Spurgeon's Sorrows, where he essentially kind of just talks about Spurgeon's uh, struggles with depression. He says, in the eyes of many people, including Christian people, depression signifies cowardice, faithlessness, or a bad attitude. Such people tell God in prayer and their friends in person that the sufferer of depression is soft or unspiritual. And again, right, we might not ever say that explicitly, but oftentimes that might be the running commentary in our minds of, well, if they just fill in the blank. If they just got involved in a community group here, right? Or if they just were a little bit more faithful in church attendance, or, you know, if they just were reading their Bible a little bit more, they probably wouldn't struggle like that. Ed Welch has written a really helpful article called Loving Those Who Are Depressed, and he's given you a variety of things which are all taken from his experience and which I've heard before of things that we shouldn't say. You know, you have to try St. John's Ward, or are you exercising enough, or I have a devotional book for you that you're going to love, or, you know, just do the next thing, or you need to trust the Lord, or, you know, some of my favorites are, have you tried this essential oil, right? If you just rub it over here. I'm not against essential oils. I have some, but Right, that's, that's not what we want to lead with, right? right? That's, that's not what we want to say to someone who's struggling with depression or anxiety. Welch goes on to say this. He says, words can reach depressed people, but only words that are accompanied by love and by understanding and faith. He says, we rarely hear very well when someone talks to us without any real interest, love, or compassion. But when godly love is wrapped around words, people listen. Isn't it true that two people 
can say the exact same thing, yet the words of one may be empty and the other beautiful. Right? Another way we might say it is this, is you can say a lot of true things, right? You can say a lot of things about trusting God, loving God, reading the Bible, going to church, but the better question might be, what is the truest and most helpful thing I can say right now? What's the truest thing that actually fits the moment, right? When we read the Proverbs, right, what the Proverbs seem to tell us is that it's not so much the content of what you say, but it's the manner and the delivery and the tone of when you say it and how you say it, right? Proverbs 15, 23 says, there is wisdom in a timely spoken word. And later on in Proverbs 16, it says that persuasiveness, that sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness, right? How can I have my speech be sweet? How can I have my speech be timely, right? That's, that's what I want to shape what I say to those who struggle with anxiety and depression. Number three, uh, listen and follow Scripture's example. Listen and follow Scripture's example. And, and, and what I mean by this is, again, Ed puts it better than I can. He says, the rhythm of your journey is simple. You speak and God listens. God speaks and you listen, right? And so when we talk about following Scripture's example, what I would say is just simply follow God's example. Allow people to speak to you and listen. Provide physical presence. Whenever we see all of the different commands in Scripture about not to be afraid or not to be fearful, which again is the most repeated command in Scripture, it's never distat and it's never unattached from a promise of God's presence. Isaiah 41.10, God says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Uh, Psalm 94, 17 through 19, David says, If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have slipped in the land of silence. When the cares, and the KJV says, when the anxieties of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. We're thinking about the, the passage that all of us have probably either quoted or had quoted to us about anxiety in Philippians 4, 4 through 7, where it talks about not being anxious. What we don't realize is that there's something that happens at the beginning of that sentence that we kind of forget to read, and it says, the Lord is at hand, semicolon, do not be anxious, right? We're very quick to the don't be anxious, right? And we can very quickly, reflexively offer that, but we forget that front end part of the Lord is at hand. And so what can you do as a helper? The number one thing I tell people uh, who are seeking to help is just simply provide physical presence. Simply provide a, a space where someone can share and can listen. Uh, I think if we've learned anything over the past two and a half years, it is what? It's that physical presence. It really matters, right? We are people who are designed and made to be seeing each other face to face and providing uh, physical presence to one another. So those are just some really basic things that regardless of your maturity level, your age, skill, whatever, those are all things that, that you can take on yourself as tools in that resource tool just to help you as you help others. For those of you tonight who might be struggling, right? You might be struggling with anxiety and depression, right? All of what we just talked about will be helpful uh, in, in, in some regards, but what are some things that, that you might do if you're a struggler? One of the things that I try to work with people in counseling on is just doing a little bit of a life audit. Just saying, okay, let's, let's kind of take a big picture look at your life. Uh, let's examine some of the voices that you're listening to. Let's take a look at some of the things that you're watching, some of the places that you're spending most of your time, some of the catalysts that seem to feed your anxiety and depression, right? Right, right now, if what you're watching is your bank account balance or inflation numbers or the stock market or the NASDAQ or your Roth IRA, well, if I did that every single day, right, my anxiety would probably be off the charts as well, right? So, so what does looking at that every day Right, what would a transition or a movement away from that look like for you, right? What would entrusting that particular area of your life over to God, what would that look like for you if you dialed that back, right? If you are someone who watches cable news uh, quite consistently, right, and, and every single night, that's what you go to bed thinking about and dwelling about. 
right? Don't be surprised then if the thoughts that, that kind of crowd and move into the space of your mind at night before you go to bed are going to be all of those images and all of those stories and all those narratives. Now, again, I'm not anti-news, but maybe it's turning off the news a half hour early. Maybe it's turning off the radio during your lunch hour. Maybe it's backing away from the amount of things that you're taking in in those various ways to uh, simply sit with your, to simply sit with scripture, to simply sit with a friend, to simply sit with a loved one. So simply just kind of doing a little bit of a life audit and say, where, where are my time and my energy and resources going? Uh, one of the things that I've noticed a lot and that a lot of my colleagues in mental health have noticed is that a lot of time is being spent alone, especially amongst teens and, and young people, that uh, there's this fascinating, there's these fascinating graphs where basically all of these graphs track on essentially the, the introduction of the iPhone in 2008, but up until a, right around 2008, one of the number one ways that teens were dying were teens were killing each other through teen homicide and through uh, various crimes like that. And then in 2008, uh, a stark trend, that began to steadily decrease and teen suicide began to increase. And what researchers have said is, teens aren't killing one another, they're killing themselves because they're so isolated. Right, one of the things that we know about anxiety and depression is that it isolates you, right? It, pulls you away from community. And so in terms of where do you spend most of your time, if most of your time is spent in isolation, is kind of spent by yourself playing video games or on your phone or, or, or kind of cloistered in your house, again, what would thoughtful movements to kind of move out of that, what would that look like, right? Maybe it's hey, why don't you come out onto your porch this evening and let's, let's go for a walk or let's, let's sit and have a conversation, right? Just thinking through simple, small, attainable goals uh, that you can do. Uh, number five, understand how depression and anxiety filter reality. Both depression and anxiety in different ways filter reality, and this is one of the number one things, I think both as helpers, but also as strugglers, uh, that, that is really helpful to understand and to learn. Uh, Ed, again, has a really helpful article that I've reprinted there for you called Depression's Odd Filter. And I would say depression in many ways, like anxiety, which we'll see in a second, puts a little bit of this weird filter uh, on words that, that people say to you. You might think of them as glasses, right? These, these weird glasses that you wear. He says, someone says to you, I love you. You hear nothing. Actually, you hear something. You hear a little voice in your brain that says, I'm worthless. You're only saying you love me because you think you have to. Somehow from the mouths of other people to your ear, all words of blessing and encouragement get tumbled upside down and backward and confirm your suspicions about yourself. You are an abject failure. You are unloved. You're unlovable and everyone knows it. There are hundreds of variations. You look nice today. Put it through the filter of depression and you get, not true, I know I'm ugly. Or, you seem to be feeling a little bit better today. This means, oh, you don't want to talk to me anymore? This is your brain on depression. And we could add, it's your brain on shame. Right? What, what Welch is simply noting there by way of human experience is that when we are struggling in despair or depression, it's like this weird filter gets affixed to our brain where people can say well-meaning things to us like, hey, I love you and I'm for you. Right, and immediately depression filters that and says, well, you're only saying that because you have to. You're saying that because you're my mom. Or you're saying that because, you're saying that because you're my dad. Or you're saying that because you're my wife. Or you're saying that because you're my husband. You, you probably can't wait to, to get out of here. You probably can't wait to, to leave for work. Or you probably can't wait. And we fill in the blank, right? We, we filter those statements through the lens of our depression, right? There's something about depression that creates this, this odd filter to well-intentioned words and actions of loved ones. And so here's the, I'd say maybe here's the other side of it for the helper then. Don't be surprised then when you say certain things that you might think are good and helpful and they get received and taken negatively, right? Oftentimes what happens then when that dynamic happens, we get what? We get offended, we get frustrated, that's not what I said, why are you taking that way? And what we don't realize is that for someone who is struggling with depression, they're filtering it through an entirely different grid than oftentimes what our intent is with what we're saying. Jason Kovacs writes this, he says, a large component of depression is the deep entrenchment of lies that Satan tempts humans to believe. 
A person can hear terrible things about his worth, his identity, and future, and in those moments, he needs to fight to believe the things that are real and true from the mouth of God. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 42 says to himself, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God, encouraging the depressed person to make an action plan for when he is speaking lies to his soul. So again, there's a variety of different ways that you can do that, right? For oftentimes when I'm working with people who are struggling with depression, I'll just simply work with them on that aspect to say, what are some of the lies right now? Just kind of tell me some of the filtered thoughts, right? When I say this to you, what do you hear? When, when, when your wife says this to you, what do you hear? When, you're, when your son or your daughter says this to you, and just simply get some of those lies out on paper and then begin to shed the light and the truth and the beauty of Scripture into those things, right? We, we know that Satan has immense ability to influence our thoughts, right? We know that one of the premier ways, in fact, that, that he moves against believers is that he's an accuser of the brethren, right? That there are these ways that he distorts and he deceives, and he destroys. And it shouldn't surprise us then that he plays a significant role oftentimes in these struggles that we face with both anxiety and depression. I've also included there for you an article by a friend named Dave Dunham. Uh, that article is called Confronting Anxiety's False Filters. And so I've listed a number of them down there for you. And so similar to depression, right, anxiety also has a way that it filters through different things, right? And uh, Dave has included a number of those different filters, right? We might say some of these filters are things like catastrophizing things or false extremes, jumping to conclusions or generalizations or nearsightedness or mind reading, false shoulds, false responsibility, emotional reasoning, all these different filters that when we're struggling with anxiety, right, that oftentimes these filters, right, keep us from viewing reality and people and situations in a way that's actually true. So maybe we had a bad experience, right, uh, in our past with someone at church, right? And maybe we have this general anxiety then about coming to any type of church gathering, right? Maybe you had a really bad experience with someone who said something to you or a slight or a hurt, and that has begun to bubble up, and, and now you have these, these anxiety filters, this generalization where just everyone is like that, Right? Every church event's gonna be like that. Somebody's gonna be out for your harm. Somebody's gonna do something to hurt you or to, 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 uh, to, to damage you, and so you pull away, right? Again, we might view that, and we might say, well, that seems so irrational, but for the person struggling with anxiety, right, who has some of those filters, right, it makes complete and total sense. Uh, for those of you who are helpers, a simple exercise sometimes I'll do with people who are struggling with some of those, uh, some of those difficult dynamics and filters of anxiety is uh, moving from even if scenarios to, or moving from what if scenarios to even if scenarios. So anxiety a lot of times will say, well, what if this happens? Or what if this happens? Or you know, what if this person gets elected? Or what if I get COVID? Or what if my mom gets cancer? And moving from what if to even if. Okay, even if that happens, here's what we'll do. Or even if that becomes reality, here's what we know to be true about your situation, about our faith, about the Lord, and what he's equipped you for. So that can just be a very simple modulation that you help people who are struggling with anxiety that both honors the struggle that they're coming to you with, but then also helps them turn the corner to say, okay, what if this happens? Okay. Even if that does happen, let's think out loud together about that. Number six, uh, again, for a struggler, just simply pay attention to your body. Again, we've talked extensively about the ways that anxiety and depression um, affect our bodies, but uh, you know, a little bit more uh, work here is going to be helpful. Uh, when we think about anxiety and depression, three of the big areas that, that any counselor or doctor will tell you uh, are diet, sleep, and exercise, right? Diet, sleep, and exercise are three very practical things three free things that are non-medical interventions that have been proven to have um, immediate effects uh, for people who struggle with anxiety and depression. Right, thinking about what you're taking in uh, physically by way of food, thinking about how much sleep you get, thinking about how much exercise you get, 
right? There, that we realize that uh, when the sun starts to come out right here in Northeast Ohio, right, that, that people tend to perk up a little bit. And so maybe people aren't feeling as depressed or anxious as we head into summer, but uh, when we get to the fall and the winter, right, and we notice that begins to spike, right, beginning to think creatively about ways that we can continue to, to get outside, to exercise, to see friends and family. Uh, not only in paying attention to our body, but just, again, like what I've said earlier, just talking about what you're feeling or experiencing, that dynamic of effect labeling. Uh, a lot of times in counseling, we'll, I'll just use these little emotion wheels. Um, I'll use them with kids or teenagers or adolescents. You can just Google emotion wheel and uh, just beginning to understand, okay, what am I feeling right now? What am I experiencing right now? Sometimes anxiety uh, maybe even feels too general. And so when you say the word anxiety, uh, people might think a lot of different things. And maybe there are more accurate words that might capture that emotion that you're experiencing, right? Maybe a more accurate word is, man, I'm feeling really trapped. I'm just feeling really trapped right now. It seems like the Lord has just shut a lot of doors in my life. I feel like I have a really uncertain future. And anxiety might just be this very general word, but, but the word that maybe better captures it, I just feel really trapped, right? Well, Scripture has a lot to say about that. Other times it might be, man, I just, I feel really stuck. I feel paralyzed. I feel embarrassed, right? I feel like people are looking at me. And again, the simple thing about an emotion wheel is it just offers you prompts. It just offers you a number of different ways to simply narrate whatever is going on inside. Other things that you can do, a simple breathing and grounding exercises. You could uh, go online to, to YouTube and just simply uh, you know, search for something like a basic breathing exercise. Uh, breathing exercises, again, are non-medical interventions that you can do to help uh, alleviate and significantly uh, engage your parasympathetic nervous system. Just simply taking a deep breath in and exhaling. Uh, an exercise oftentimes that we do with uh, counselees, both kids and adults, is what we call the five, four, three, two, one grounding exercise, where you take a deep breath in and you just count down uh, five things that you can see, uh, four things that you can hear, uh, three things that you can touch, two things that you can taste, one thing that you can smell. Again, you can put them in any order that you want, but the purpose of a grounding exercise and as you're doing those deep breathing things are simply to ground you in reality. Right? So if one of the aspects about anxiety is that anxiety imagines a future without God in it, right? what grounding exercises practically do is it helps ground you in, okay, this is what's happening presently. So, you know, I've done this before with my kids. I've done it before with clients as well. If they're in a hyper-aroused state of anxiety, I'll just say, okay, let's do this together, okay? Let's just take a deep breath and exhale. Just tell me five things right now that you can see. Right? I can see an exit sign. I can see some chairs, I see a camera, I see that television, and I see the lights, right? And what's beginning to happen physically in your mind is that you're actually engaging that parasympathetic nervous system. The rest and digest part of your brain is sometimes what uh, scientists call it, right? That parasympathetic nervous system is just simply kicking into gear, and it's talking to your, your sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, flight, freeze part of your brain, and it's essentially just saying, hey, calm down. Just, you can be safe right now. Just take a deep breath. So just engaging uh, some of those uh, just practical exercises uh, to attend to your body are going to be helpful. Uh, last but not least, uh, number seven, uh, check your circles of responsibility. And I've just, uh, there on your, uh, on your handout, I've just tried to include uh, two, I call them nested circles, two, you know, one circle inside of another. In Psalm 131, David talks about uh, entrusting himself to the Lord. He says, I, I do not want to get involved with things that are too great or too difficult for me. He says, I, I, I want to sit and quiet my soul before the Lord. And oftentimes in anxiety and in depression, what we do with that inner circle is we expand it into areas that are beyond our control. So if the inner circle is you and the outer circle is God, anxiety and depression sometimes blows up that inner circle, right? We try to control more things that are outside of our control than are rightly within our control. And what we are seeking to do then is, okay, how do we more properly get the relationship between this inner circle of what God has called me to do, and what do I need to entrust to the Lord, right? Uh, biblically, we might say that those nested circles are just a pictorial way to represent Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart 
Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 doesn't says this. Uh, trust in the Lord for salvation, because God's got that. But in politics and in finances and in kids and schooling, you know, trust in your own understanding, because you're smart and you got this, right? That's not how the verse reads. It's, it's, it's total in its scope. It's trust in the Lord with what? with all of your heart, the very core of who you are, not just part of it, right? God doesn't want just part. He wants everything. He wants your trust and your fidelity in every area of life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Now, what Proverbs doesn't say is, and if you do that, right, you're never gonna have any struggles. No, it's the Lord will direct your paths, right? And so when we're thinking about those nested circles, right, what I'm constantly trying to do, even in my own heart, is, I'm asking myself on a daily balance, right? Lord, what things are within my control and what things are out of my control? You know, one of the things that makes me really anxious uh, is the traffic, right? And the road construction on Route 8. You guys are north of the Central Interchange, but I live in green. And so every day, a couple of my, one of my daughters goes to CVCA. I have to drive through the central interchange every single day, two times a day on most days, sometimes more than that. And, and I think to myself, I get so upset and so anxious about how long is this gonna take? Why aren't people moving? Why are construction workers just sitting on this side of the road? And why are we down to one lane in Route 8? And where are these bridges going to nowhere? And I have to calm myself down, right? And this is an insight into the craziness of my mind, but I have to ask myself, does this belong in my circle of control? Or is this ultimately interest of the Lord? Would I like it to be in my control? I probably would, but I have no idea how to build roads, right? And it would be a horrible mess if I was in charge of it, right? So what do I do? I have to pray to the Lord. I have to confess that. I'd say, God, that's not in my circle of control. I release that to you. I'm entrusting that to you, right? And another dynamic sometimes that oftentimes happens is that when I am, when I am trying to focus on those circles of control, I'm also typically in, in an effort to expand those, I also shrink other things I should be doing. So when I am expanding, I'm also shrinking things that God is calling me to do, like trust in him, rely on him, and to be spirit-led. So again, if you are struggling with anxiety or depression, right, maybe one of the, the simple exercises that you do is you just kind of take this home and you say, okay, the things that are really causing me anxiety today, let's just start with today, what circle do they belong in? And my hunch will be that probably 90% of the things that do cause you some anxiety are probably in that center circle and probably need to be moved to that outer circle, right? That doesn't mean that they're not concerns anymore. That doesn't mean that they're not pressures on you. But what you actually realize is though, ultimately though, those things belong to the Lord and not to me. So uh, we'll close with that. I hope that those have just been some helpful things to think about, not only as a helper, uh, but also for those of you who are strugglers. Uh, on the last two pages of your handout, I've tried to include a number of different resources there for you. Uh, one page is uh, specific to anxiety. Uh, some of those things are also hyperlinks where uh, I provided the electronic handout uh, to, to Dan and to Todd and they can get that out to you. Those are just different articles and resources that if you click them, they'll take you to different um, articles, video, resources, podcasts. And then on that second page, the same thing for depression. So again, some of those things will be helpful. I'm not saying just, you know, if you read a book, you'll be cured, but sometimes those things can help help shed light on your experience. So I think we're going to take a pause. We have a few minutes left to, to work through some questions. So how do you want to work this, Dan? Testing, one, two, check. All right. Um, so you guys have the number on the screen, and you text them in. I will receive them up here on this computer, and I'll ask them to Jonathan uh, via the mic. It's all going to be anonymous. Uh, just a couple of notes is uh, I will filter through them. I will have every question answered, uh, if that means I have to follow up with Jonathan and get you that information. Uh, but I specifically want to address ones that maybe deal with uh, some general advice about as a, either a helper or uh, someone who's a struggler, as well as maybe some specific um, uh, things that you might be going through or know of somebody who is. And so I'll start with this first question. Um, this person said that uh, their daughter has a friend at school that is daily threatening to hurt herself, and her uh, daughter has told uh, the adult teachers and principal uh, that don't seem to be doing anything, but it's, it's causing her daughter some extreme stress and concern, and it's taking a lot of space in her head and her time and concentration out of school. She asks, how can we help with these two girls, both the one who is 
threatening to hurt herself, as well as the friend who is bearing that burden yeah. on her shoulders? Well, it's such a good question, and, and, and I wish I could say, man, that's the first time I've heard that recently, but I've heard that uh, more times than, than, than I would care to admit. I would say that, uh, for me, when you think about those circles, right, that type of circle dynamic for that young lady whose friend is doing that, that places an enormous amount of pressure on her, right? Essentially, her friend is putting in her circle of control saying, listen, I need you to help pull me out of whatever state of depression where I'm wanting to take my own life. And um, I, I think that that's not a good situation for that friend to be in. So as a parent, just given, I don't know what the dynamics are in terms of what has been described of, hey, they've talked to teachers and nothing's happened, but I would definitely want to reach out to teachers, school counselors, authorities, again, just because uh, suicide is such a serious issue. Oh, here's what I would not be doing. I would not be evaluating the threat level of, oh, she's probably just making a big deal or trying to get attention or uh, that's not our role and that's not our job. I would be saying, okay, for my daughter though, here are the steps that I need to take. Uh, not only educating her to say, hey, here's what's in your control and here's what you can do versus what you're not, but also then also talking to uh, school authorities and teachers to say, hey, this, this really does need to be addressed. Um, so when we talk about boundaries, right, that language can get tossed around in some um, really unhelpful ways, but uh, that would definitely be a boundary marker that I would want my daughter to help develop uh, personally to say, hey, when, when you share those sorts of things, uh, that puts me into a really difficult position. And so if you continue to say those things to me, I am going to have to go and share that with a trusted adult. Uh, you know, so a lot of times teenagers will say, well, I'm going to tell you this, but you can't tell anyone else. And uh, that just, again, puts teens into such difficult positions. So bouncing that up to the next appropriate level of authority, I think, would be important. Not assessing the risk or the threat of that. You know, not telling your daughter, well, just, you know, that's probably not a big deal, or you can just ignore it. But then also not succumbing in saying, well, you've got to help her. Like, you know, make sure you're there for her. Respond to every text message. Again, what does an overreaction look like? What does an underreaction look like? I'm normally trying to help parents and teens. What does a proper reaction, given the circumstances, what would that look like? Uh, this next question is, can anxiety be genetic or a learned behavior? Example is an anxious mom noticing a child starting to have anxious tendencies. Right. I, I don't know scientifically or empirically, you know, if there's been work on that as much as I do know, there's probably been more work on that related to depression. Uh, but in terms of just, yeah, people picking up certain behaviors, I think we would say that would be true about a lot of things from our family of origin, that certain struggles, I mean, positive things as well, right? Maybe there's certain positive traits that your children begin to exhibit from you. That can also happen with uh, things that can be more debilitating, like anxiety. And sometimes what happens, at least what I notice personally, is that we can see it in our children before we see it in ourselves. So what we might just say is like a personality trait or a temperament issue. When we begin to see it in our teen or a son or a daughter, we might say, we might, what I say, like pathologize it. Like, oh, this is, this is not good and this is wrong and not realize, oh, some of these behaviors might be learned. So in terms of whether or not they're genetic or not, I'll leave that to people who are much smarter than me. What I would say is I do think a lot of those behaviors can be picked up. They can be caught, they can be learned, uh, but they're not life sentences either, right? We can grow, as we've seen uh, from a variety of different ways. We can, we can grow in the midst of those struggles, though, as well. This next question, I think this is an uh, important one to hear as both a church and as individuals wanting to help. How do, how do we, um, or what are some good ways to destigmatize counseling for people who may be doubtful? I think you said yes. earlier 35% don't yes. get help. How yes. can we do that? Yes. I, well, it's a, it's a wonderful question. The first thing I'd say is just talk about need, right? Don't prioritize the strong and the healthy and the people who always have it together. Um, but talk about the needy, right? If we, if we know anything from Jesus' ministry, we know this. He has an affinity for people who are weak and needy, right? He has no, you know, people who have no need of a doctor, right? He says to the Pharisees, you don't need me, right? You've got your life together. You're perfectly functioning. You've got it all together. You know every scripture verse, and you know how to do this, that, and the other. You're good to go. You don't need me. S scripture shows us Jesus has an affinity for those who are needy. 
Um, so I would say definitely talk about it. We should be talking about it in sermon illustrations. We should talk, be talking about it with our children. Um, when we can give honest testimony to how counseling has been beneficial, I think in many ways that can destigmatize things. Uh, I know that even in my own personal life and ministry, as I've talked about my journey with counseling or talked about receiving counseling, that, that, that oftentimes can destigmatize uh, counseling for a lot of people. Uh, we had Ed Welch at Parkside years ago, and I think one of the very first things he talked about when he talked about anxiety was he said, I've had a panic attack before. And you could kind of just see people in the audience, just kind of their shoulders relax a little bit, right? Just, okay, he, he knows what I've been through. He knows what I've experienced. And so being honest about those things, again, the reason why we can be honest about those is because God himself invites those things. And so talking about them, um, I think is a, huge, is a huge part in destigmatizing that. And then not only in talking about it, but then when people say that they need help, connecting them, right? Like I know that CCC has a wonderful uh, care team and has a lot of different uh, counselors at their center for care. And there's a, there's a lot of wonderful organizations, you know, here in Northeast Ohio, in addition to Fieldstone, that, that would love to, to come alongside people. That's good. This next one uh, comes from a teacher who says one of their triggers is uh, dealing with the behavior of children and their out-of-control parents. Uh, things like disrespect, kids' disrespect, left us lack of self-control, no expectations, or supervision at home. How can I handle student behavior when their parents are lacking control as oh, a trigger? That's, that, that's a good question. I mean, first I would say I think this would be a situation probably where counseling would be really helpful. We're simply having an area where you can share these things in a safe space, a confidential space would be good. Um, if whoever submitted this doesn't have that opportunity for whatever reason, I would say a simple thing, not simple by way of simplistic, but one of the techniques that we, I would encourage you to do would be what's called negative emotional tolerance. So when this disrespect is happening, you're probably feeling some negative emotions, right? She talks about being triggered. Well, what are some of those things? And being able to name those. Well, I feel, I feel really embarrassed right now because they're disrespecting me in front of everybody or I'm feeling frustrated, or I'm feeling not heard. Again, identifying that emotion in the moment, and then what we say is just regulating it or being able to tolerate it in the moment, right? The opposite of that is being dysregulated, which would be just giving voice to that emotion, so a kid's disrespectful and you like lash out and yell at them, or suppressing that, what we call an over-regulation of emotion, where somebody disrespects us and we just act like it doesn't bother us. We just kind of push it deep, deep, deep down inside of our soul. We don't want to over-regulate or dysregulate our emotions and we don't want to under-regulate them. How can we say, okay, right now before the Lord, I'm going to pray and just bring this negative emotion to the Lord and sit with it, but then also still engage the student. And again, I'm not saying that that will just happen overnight, but that negative emotional tolerance, I think, will help you to be able to respond in some of those moments without feeling so triggered. But to that person, I'd also say, I do think counseling would probably be really beneficial for you too. Taking some deep breaths also before that. Just again, it's a simple non-medical intervention. You were literally oxygenating every blood cell in your body and helping you have a saner response. This person writes, I oftentimes dismiss my anxiety. How do I come to grips with that, uh, that my anxiety is an issue and that I shouldn't just dismiss it by saying I'm fine? Right, I would say I'm fine are two of the worst words we say in the church. Um, you know, it's this, it's this odd dynamic, again, going back to the Beatitudes where Sunday mornings is the worst, right? Everybody, you know, what's the question? How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing? I mean, it's like that, we don't really have like too much variety in how we answer everything is I'm fine, I'm fine, you know, and our kids say it to us too. And uh, again, if that's a true answer, I'd say that's okay, but statistically speaking, we know that that can't be a true answer for the vast majority of us, right? We're not all fine and we're not all okay. And so one of the things we might just do is, hey, we're gonna pause before we just immediately say we're fine. Uh, we're gonna pause and we're gonna be a little bit more thoughtful. Or maybe even we'll balance it out a bit and say, hey, uh, I'm doing okay, but here's some things that have been difficult. Now, here's the problem with that, is that in the church, we actually don't want that type of dialogue because it requires too much out of us, right? And so we like I'm fine because it's kind of code for we don't need to do ministry to one another. We don't need to pray for one another. We don't need to bear one another's burdens. We don't need to be patient with one another. We don't need to love one another. We don't need to greet one, you know, and 
we have to realize, man, part of this is the problem is, is us, right? The problem is how we have structured church. And so, you know, probably a lot of you could surprise people on Sunday morning. If somebody says, hey, how are you doing? You should say, not fine, you know, and see how they respond, right? And even a not fine response, okay, oh, that, 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 that caught me off guard. And, and maybe we say, well, tell me more. What did you mean by that? And we say, oh, you know, this, this was hard for me this week, and I haven't had a chance to share that with anyone, you know, would you pray? And then this wonderful moment, right, in five minutes before church transforms into a moment of ministry. Um, so that would be like my best case scenario is we stop saying I'm fine, we seek to be a little bit more honest, so. Um, this person asked, and um, I'm trying to structure it in a good way that'll help, but I think uh, the question is how do I tell somebody that they may need help or maybe seek professional um, when they're getting defensive? Right, when they're getting defensive. I would say that, that that's, a, that's a hint for me too. Again, put yourself into that position. When, you're, when you are defensive, there's a lot of different things probably happening physically where your ability, because of those, remember those odd filters, right? Somebody says to you, hey, I think that you should get help. And what does it filter through? I'm crazy, I'm a burden, you don't wanna be with me, I'm a drag, you wish I wasn't here, I should go somewhere else, I'm too much trouble, nobody likes me, right? That's what gets filtered through. So if I'm wanting to offer help, how can I do it in a way that acknowledges some of those filters and, and seeks to, to take the glasses off? So you might say something like this, hey, what I'm about to say, you might think is me saying, I think you're crazy, but, but you're not, you're really not. I, I love you and I'm for you. And I'm just wondering if you've ever considered maybe talking to someone about these things. So again, what we're doing is it's a, it's a technique we call shame attenuation. And to attenuate means that we just, at the front end, we seek to acknowledge the difficulties that might come with something we're about to say. We attenuate what we're about to say to the situation that they're in. So we just simply say, hey, I know this is probably, th this might be hard for you or I know that this could get taken in a different way, so I want to really be careful with how I say it. And then maybe ask for feedback. We don't typically like feedback because sometimes that feedback can hurt, but we might just say, how did that hit you? Like, how did that, how did that come across? Because I want to make sure, because this is such an important issue, I really want to make sure that, that you heard where I was coming from. Uh, so that's why I definitely think these conversations are best in person. I'm definitely not a fan of text, you know, when you're having these sorts of things. Just so much, I mean, you know, our emotional IQ level has gotten shrunk down to emojis, right? We just don't even know how to communicate emotions, so we just, you know, we have all these emojis now that can do it for us, and I, I really lament that for us because we have lost so much humanity in just being able to, to kind of speak face to face, so. Yeah. I got a couple more here. Okay. Um, how do you handle getting burnout from a toxic person, specifically someone who's always negative and repeating the same thing about their negativity about yes. a certain subject? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Again, I would notice, I would want to identify what are some of the emotions in my own heart about this quote unquote toxic person. And I would wanna make sure that toxicity is not just a synonym for uh, this person's a burden to me. Um, Again, Jesus moves towards people who have burdens. Uh, we are people who are called to bear one another's burdens. We're called to cast our burdens on Christ. So having burdens actually seems to be a unique qualification for what it means to be a Christian. Uh, the person who is unburdened more often than night seems to be someone who is quite self-sufficient, quite self-reliant, and quite self-assured. So the person who has no burdens and who has no need, to me, doesn't quite look like a Christian, according to the New Testament. So for this person then who has a lot of burdens, right, how do I recapture then the gauge, the gaze of, man, this person is a burden to, man, this person is a fellow human being who's needy like I am. I am needy and needed. I'm needy and needed. Right? That's the core part of who we are as image bearers of God. One of the things that, the reason why this person might be quote unquote a burden to you is because maybe you're trying to do it alone. Is there a way that this burden can be shared amongst other believers? Is there a way that you can point this person to other resources, not by way of a handoff, 
but by way of engaging other resources. So not saying, hey, you probably should go talk to Todd or Dan, you know, and that's a way to alleviate yourself of them. But to say, hey, would you like to go with me to talk to Todd or to talk to Dan, right? That, that, that simple pronoun change, it, it says something, right? Instead of, hey, go off on your own, go, go call the church office and make an appointment. Hey, what would it look like if after service, both you and I did that together, right? Um, and depending on the strength of this relationship too, I do think that some type of thoughtful disclosure might be helpful where you say, hey, you know, there are some aspects of this that I do feel like are hard for me and that I might not be the best person for it. And so what would it look like to engage some other resources around me? But that wouldn't be my first instinct. That would be a little bit later on down the road. I've got two questions about um, people who hurt themselves, both uh, one specifically speaks about cutting, um, but one responds by not being able to give a reason why. Mm -hmm. Just kind of cast it off and just mm -hmm. maybe just stress. The other one jokes about it. Yeah. So how would you handle those two? Yeah, you know, self-harm is a, is a whole other category into itself. I definitely think it's, a, it's an area where you would want to engage trusted uh, people here within your church, uh, trusted counseling professionals. Uh, people who self-harm and uh, whether it be through cutting or bruising, burning, et cetera, there's a lot of different forms of self-injury. Uh, typically, people who are doing that want to feel something. So self-harm is a lot different than suicide where people are trying to end their suffering and pain. Typically, with self-harm, I'm trying to feel something that will help me forget about the suffering and the pain. It helps me physically feel a rush. Uh, it feels, you know, feels like some type of high. Um, so I'm wanting, to, I'm wanting to move into that experience a little bit more with some thoughtful question asking. I, I would want to recommend uh, a level of clinical and professional help, though, as well to that individual. Um, the why question, again, the why question wouldn't string me up too much in terms of I need to know why they are doing this as much as, okay, what do we do right now in the moment? The why question can take you down a lot of different paths, but... The whys, at least for me typically, are less satisfying than the, okay, what do we do right now? Um, if anything, you can say, like if somebody just, you're asking a lot of why questions and they're not answering or they're saying, I don't know, I kind of just play like the reverse psychology trick and just say, well, if you did know, if you could just kind of make up a, a reason why, what do you think it would be? And like unscientifically, 50% of the time it works, you know, uh, where they'll say, well, you know, it's this or it's this. So if you don't know, just give me an idea if you did know, what would that look like? Um, I think that tends to work a little bit better with teens and children, because teens and children a lot of times will say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Well, if you did know, what would it be? Um, so those would be some thoughts on that. But self-harm, self-injury are definitely things where you're wanting to bring in an additional layer of help, I think. So. That's good. This is, uh, we're over time, so okay. I want, I'm going to have this to be the last question. Right. Um, this one says... Uh, usually when I have bouts of anxiety where I experience panic attacks and lack of sleep for a duration of time, it is followed by a lack of emotion for a period of time. Mm -hmm. One, is that normal, and how do I regulate, healthily regulate that aspect of anxiety? Yes, I, I would say that that doesn't surprise me. That does sound normal to me. So again, physically, your sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, response where you experience a perceived threat, your brain kicks into overdrive to protect yourself. When you stay at that high level, it's taking a lot of emotional energy to stay at that high level. So when you're staying at that high level, you are going to be exhausted, right? And, you know, that amount of cortisol and adrenaline that's running through your veins, it's going to be hard to sleep. So then when you come off of that, you know, imagine a gas tank, you're going to feel quite emotionally depleted. And so that feeling of numbness or we call it anhedonia, just not being able to feel anything, uh, that would be common. That's where I do think an emotion wheel can be helpful because it kind of helps center you outside of yourself to kind of look at it and say, oh, like, this is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling nothing. Well, that's a feeling, right? Feeling numb is something. That at least gives me a start. Um, and so then the movement, right, might be, okay, what would, what would feeling, again, what would that look like, right? How can I have the affections of my heart? How can I bring that before the Lord and ask for help in this area? So, um, but with panic attacks, like if this, you know, this person is saying they're having panic, panic attacks, again, this is where when your anxiety reaches that level of acuity and, and um, just, you know, where you're actually having panic attacks, again, that's where counseling, I think, can be a very helpful part 
of, of healing and growth there. So. Okay. Well, let's thank Jonathan for his time. Thank you, guys. I'm just going to close our time out in prayer. Uh, again, we've, we've said this as a church, and uh, if you would like more information on what's available for different counseling centers, we do have a sheet on our welcome guest with several um, just referrals that we'd love to get in your hands if you're interested in looking. Um, like I said, Jonathan is with Fieldstone, and uh, they'd love to to minister to you in any way possible. Um, before I pray, I do want to say some of our pastors, we just want to make ourselves available to you tonight. If you want just simply someone to pray with, we are not professional counselors by any mean, but we, we would love to uh, hear your story and listen and pray with you if you're interested. So we'll be stationed over in the cafe and love just to take some moments uh, tonight if you need it uh, to pray with you. But I'm going to close for our night and uh, we will be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, first and foremost, we want to thank you um, for your son, Jesus, Lord, that has uh, suffered and died so that we might have eternal life. Lord, I pray, Lord, as we look to that hope for a future, Lord, that you would just remind us of your love and your promises for us. Lord, as we navigate these things or help those who are, Lord, that we would always keep our eyes on you. And just know, Lord, that even in the midst of our pain, Lord, we have a Savior who loves us and wants to journey with us through that. Lord, we thank you so much for tonight and what we've learned. I just pray as we apply it to ourselves as helpers or as those who struggle, Lord, that uh, we would take steps, Lord, to trust you more, but also to seek out help in areas, Lord, that we might be encouraged and find ways to regulate these bodies that are screaming, Lord, to be with you for eternity and to be restored to the, the creation that you've desired for us to be. Lord, we thank you in all things and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for coming. You all are dismissed.